tell me yeah. about your jiu-jitsu, like roughly how long you've trained for and that journey? Yes. Okay. So I started probably about two and a half years ago. Uh, I was, I've been training at uh, Ipswich to Bean um, here in downtown Ipswich. Um, I've started probably about a month after my husband did. So he started, the club was quite small then. Um, we've seen a massive um, increase in membership over the last probably two years. Um, and yeah, probably the best club in Ipswich, although I haven't been to any other clubs. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I love the training there. Um, yeah. So I've got my blue belt about two, about a year and a half ago awesome. uh, and just love it. Um, I've been in the police for about 15 years and I probably feel more confident now after starting my jujitsu journey than I do or I did when I was walking the streets with a Glock on my hip. So I, I honestly think that the jujitsu or the skills and the confidence that I've obtained training jujitsu has helped me immensely in my job. Um, and I kind of wish I started sooner, but a lot of people say that. So, <laughs> and I think um, last year I had, like everyone, it was a bit of a turbulent year with COVID, um, but I had a, um, a, a cancer experience. I, had a, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and I had to have a couple of radical surgeries to, to fix that, but I'm cancer free now. So my journey in terms of getting back to training from an injury, I've, I'm a bit experienced in that, although the ACL stuff is a bit different to what I had last year. Um, but I only really just got back onto the mats full time in November last uh, last year. So it's yeah been a bit frustrating to say the least. <laughs> having get back to having you know, been through what I did last year and then finally get back on the mats and then do my knee. And I actually didn't do my knee doing jujitsu. I did my knee playing basketball. So ah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I my physio thinks it's a little bit of a good thing that I'm not going to have that fear of going back to the mats thinking I'll re-injure it during what, you know, maybe what caused the injury. Um, but I am sort of nervous about um, it happening again and um, having my job being a physical job and needing to be active and needing to be, um, I'm, I'm actually behind a desk at the moment working in Intel, but um, I could be called to go on the road at any time. So I need to be physically fit and able. So yeah, there's always that in the back of my mind. So I've quit basketball <laughs> and <laughs> I'm going to stick with jiu-jitsu. So, um, yeah, that's really it in a nutshell. How long, were you, how long were you out of commission after your surgeries for ovarian cancer? Yes. So I was kind of lucky, if you can call it that, um, because I was diagnosed in March 2020. Um, that's when they found the tumour and that was right, right when COVID hit. So no one was training. So I didn't really have any FOMO, which was kind of good. Um, but I had surgeries back to back. So I had um, surgery to remove the tumour. Then I had another surgery to um, have a radical hysterectomy. And then about, I think it was two or three months later, I actually had an incisional hernia. So I had to have that repaired. Um, I was very good with my physio, which is sort of not like me. I'm very much like, I'm, you know, I'm right. I'll get back into it. But I was very strict. Um, but my surgeon said to me, because of my back-to-back -back surgeries with the, because um, I had to have a laparotomy to have the tumour removed. So I was cut from belly button to pelvis. Mm. Um, so that followed by the uh, hysterectomy so close caused a bit of a, the incision to not heal properly. And then when I did get back to doing sort of physio and stuff, the hernia happened. So um, getting back onto the mats, I was very control. I went back doing just technique, uh, no rolling. I definitely have, I pick my opponents and if anyone that weighs less than me. Um, and I sort of had to develop a bit of a different game where I was more on top. Uh, so I didn't have anyone heavy on, on top of me because I was just worried about that core and the core strength that was still developing and getting back, back to where it was. Um, but yeah, then I basically felt stronger than ever after I had the hernia surgery in August last year and yeah, training was sort of back. I, I still, I'm very selective about the part that I'm people I train with and we have a lot of uh, 20 year old male white belts. So we were extremely athletic and are really nice, but I'm very conscious that um, they're bigger and stronger than me and I want to keep going in my jiu-jitsu journey. So, 
That's, yeah, that yeah. sounds like a smart decision. Yeah. Okay. Um, and okay, so you with your when you did your ACL, you were playing basketball, but you, yes. did you what was the injury there? Did you rupture it? Yeah, so complete rupture of the ACL, and I tore my uh, MCL as well. Yeah. So I did that in July, um, the 19th of July, and I had surgery on the 13th of August. So I had to sort of do a little prehab before my surgery, wait for the swelling to go down. Um, the initial scans indicated there might have been a meniscus, um, damage to the meniscus as well. But when my surgeon had a look at the scan, she was pretty confident that it was just ACL. Um, and then when she went in, yeah, repaired the ACL with the hamstring graft and yeah. there was damage to my um, MCL. So when I woke up, because she promised me no brace, and when I woke up, I was in this full robotic-looking brace. So I was a bit sh shocked by that. So I was in that for six weeks um, just to hit, let the meniscus, sorry, let the MCL heal. Um, yeah. And I think at the five-week mark when I saw my surgeon, she was confident that the MCL had healed. So I've been out of the brace for about two and a bit weeks now. Okay. How long ago was the surgery? Uh, on the 13th of August. So that was eight, eight weeks. I'm in my ninth week now of recovery. Okay. Yeah. Right. So you're at, yeah, ninth week. Still pretty mm -hmm. much in the pointy end of the whole rehab piece, huh? Yeah. And, and very much like when all the reading um, that I've done on the injury and the recovery process, you know, they talk about it not being a linear um, uh, process. And yeah, that's very true because <laughs> I'll have a week where I think, oh, yes, I'm really, it's tracking very well. And then the next day or so I'll be like a bit of swelling or it just won't feel as, as good. So, yeah. What, um, so I guess the, tell me what your main concerns are at this point. Like, and I guess thinking about um, the pain that you're experiencing, thinking about the, the apprehension about going back to jiu-jitsu, um, yeah. you know, any, any of those kinds of like around the whole, the whole situation you're in, what are those concerns that you have right now? Um, probably the biggest thing would be like the lack of confidence in it and having to maybe adjust the way I play my jiu-jitsu game with it. Although, like, like I said, I didn't do it doing jiu-jitsu. Um, I mean, there's always that fear in the back of your mind when we do stand up. Like I, I tend to sort of um, even prior to doing the knee, I would avoid doing certain things like the stand up takedowns and stuff like that. Not that I had problems with my knee. I, I think it's just that lack of confidence and thinking, oh, I did do something. Um, you know, I'd be out of work, having been off work for like nine months last year. Um, and then I do two games of basketball and do my knee. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I think, uh, and the physios I've got, I've hit the jackpot with the physio, which she's amazing. And obviously their, their aim is to get me back to my chosen sport, which they, you know, they thought was basketball. I'm like, no, I'm scrapping that. I'm retiring. Um, but yeah, jujitsu. And I think, uh, you know, the timeline for that, cause I know they say nine to 12 months for ACL to return to your chosen sport. Yeah. Um, but I think to just seeing it's that like it's a bit of a different beast and having a physio who's not familiar with the sport, like it's a bit of a lack of, like, lack of confidence as well in that respect. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. I think that like the having physios and it would be really nice if you could have a surgeon who knew about jujitsu, but that's generally not going to be the case. However, yeah. have a physio that understands what we do and just i suppose how chaotic the sport can be at times and the training yeah is yeah is, is so valuable um because i mean i had with my surgeon as an example i told him you know i saw him multiple times and and, and then i told him i was a jiu-jitsu guy and we spoke about it and he was like oh how's the jiu-jitsu going and all that kind of stuff and then i remember one day uh, after I'd had my surgery, I went back in for maybe a three month checkup and one of his colleagues came by and needed to speak to him very quickly. And he introduced me to his colleague and he said, Oh, this is Joey here. He's a Muay Thai fighter. He's uh yeah, he's a, he's a kickboxer, you know, something. And, and I, you know, I just sort of said, Oh yeah. Hey man, nice to meet you. I didn't correct him, but I thought to him, it's all the same. It's like, Oh, whatever you do some martial arts, 
Um, yeah. And, you know, and whatever, he's a busy guy, he's, you know, th- that sort of thing. But at the same time, it also just indicated to me that, that he didn't really care that much about my individual situation to, um, to learn about what I need to do. It was really just, oh, you've got an ACL. Yeah, let's fix that. Let's fix the rest of the knee. Okay, you're good to go. Statistically, you know, the timelines and whatnot. Yeah. You're good to go back to sport. So that made me really, that just reinforced this idea for me that your physiotherapist is the person that they can get to know you more intimately. And yeah. it's more about that ongoing relationship. And, you know, you said you lucked out. I think that's so valuable in the situation you're in. Yeah, definitely. I had, I had the same thing because I started uh, towards the end of the year after going through my recovery process. So I, I sort of had that thing where I want to do everything and anything. I'm, I'm 37. I've got two young kids. And so I decided to take up tie as well. Um, so, and then the basketball thing I was, th- was on top of that was just, oh, okay, I want to do everything. So let's do basketball as well. So I was surprised I haven't done my knee doing Thai or doing jujitsu and, um, that Thai boxing? And I think I, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we do a bit of the bit of it at the gym. One of our black belts there, um, cause he's, I think it's his black singlet in Thai. So he, yeah, he, I just wanted to do something different as well. And, um, but yeah, when I spoke to my my surgeon, is kind of like she's really good as well. She's an Iron Woman, so she understands the whole athletic background in terms of wanting to get back to sport. But yeah, I had to always liken it to wrestling. I said it's not. She goes, oh, it's a similar thing. Is that karate? I said, no, 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 it's not karate. It's more like wrestling on the ground. So when I say that, they kind of go a bit, oh, okay. Um, yeah, ne- definitely nine months, Jess. So I was like, oh my god, really? Um, but yeah. I, well, it's it's good. it's comforting to know that other people are sort of in the same boat in terms of getting people to understand our sport. Yeah, yeah, that's an ongoing challenge. That's an ongoing challenge, and I think, um, yeah, not not settling. You know, for for anyone that's watching this, like not settling for the first physio that you know, or maybe it's a friend who's a physiotherapist. Or it's just like go and try different ones and find the one that knows you and understands the sport because it's it's worth the time researching. Yeah, most definitely. Tell me, um, what do you, you know, when you, when you contacted me, you mentioned, um, you mentioned obviously the surgery with the ovarian cancer and then the ACL, um, you mentioned getting back to work with the police, um, getting back to jujitsu. What, uh, what specifically, you know, would you like to know, or are you sort of, uh, is, is a bit sort of, um, blurry in your mind about that? I think, um, because I'm still so early on, it feels like it's so far away. Um, I mean, the idea, even with work, because I'm on a return to work program, um, uh, which doesn't mean all that much. It just means I can't do my mandatory training just yet. Uh, Like with firearm training and that kind of thing. Um, So, but in terms of going, going back on the mats and I know, like you said, the ACL recovery is pretty, um, it's pretty straightforward in terms of, you know, these are the phases, these are the steps you have to tick off as you progress. And then, um, but in terms of my jujitsu uh, training, I know that there will be the times that I could probably go back on the mat and not, not necessarily partake in um, rolling or even the technique, depending on what it is. Um, but I just wanted to sort of uh, talk to you, especially with someone that's had a similar, like similar injury sort of what you what steps you want to talk to keep like like your mind going and and sort of that you're not stepping away so much that you lose those skills because I that's what one of my main concerns is like oh I'm 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 early in my blue belt but I'm close. I know I'm close to edging towards my purple belt. So I think that that fear of losing all those skills is is still in my mind. Yeah and that I makes sense. wanted to see yeah see what steps you want to talk to keep you know, the mind going to keep your skill set there. Um, yeah, basically. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, look, from a jujitsu perspective for me, um, I think I've, it's, it's almost the same as just coming out of lockdown here in Sydney where, you know, we've had sort of almost four months where we've been locked down and for people who were really into jujitsu, they still managed to find a way to do some jujitsu. Right. Um, I, I, I've, you know, I've been doing it for, I don't know, 12 years now, 13 years. And 
um, because I'm so interested in my, in my strength and mobility training as well as jujitsu being something that I like, yeah. not being able to do jujitsu for me doesn't, it, do, it, it doesn't impact me in the same way now that it might have, say, when I was at that blue purple belt junction where I was frothing really hard about jujitsu and it was like everything that I was doing. Um, and, you know, talking to you, I mean, you're obviously very into it, but I can, you know, you have other interests as well, right? Did, yeah. did a bit of my entire basketball, those sorts of things. So I think mm. you're, you're probably not quite at that stage anymore either. But I think it was a real benefit to me just having interest in other areas because I could, I could do training, you know, I could, I could work on other stuff. Um, yeah. And my, my view of it has always been that if you can look after your body so you can be strong and you can be mobile and you can be working on, on maintaining and developing that, then you're always in a good position to go back to any sport because that's the, yeah. that's the foundation on which you build your jiu-jitsu technique and, and you know, performance. Um, that said, I, I, think I, took, I think I took around eight or 12 weeks off jiu-jitsu, as in I didn't go to the academy. And then I started going back to the, the academy just to hang out. So I'd go in, I'd do my, um, you know, I'd do my rehab work, which was, which was in that early stage, you know, around where you're at now. It's pretty, it's pretty light on, right? Like you're not really doing a lot. So I'm off to the side doing that. But I'd just hang out and get to see everyone. And I think that, one, I did that because I wanted my coach to see that I'm still there and I'm still interested. Um, but also, too, it was just really staying connected to the social aspect of the sport and, you know, to the community at the gym. Um, and it allowed, me, it allowed me to sort of start to dip my toes in the water and test certain things. So I think, like, just being there on the mats puts you in a position where your teammates can ask you questions. And then before you know it, you're kind of in there with them. Oh, hey, let me show you this thing. Or, sure, I can help you with that. And, you're starting to do a little bit of jiu-jitsu, but in a very controlled way. Uh, and it was in those sort of early exchanges or like, you know, which, which probably lasted for a couple of months where I started to under make, I guess, the very clear parameters of what I couldn't, couldn't do became um, obvious to me. So I'm like, yeah. holy shit, I can't, like I can't cross that leg or I can't close a triangle or I can't, um, I can't play butterfly guard, but I could, but I did realize that I could demonstrate things. If I was on top, I could show a lot of positions from side control. Um, I could show positions from half guard, things like that. So that was really helpful because you're just starting to get a, an impression of how you can perform with this leg that is going through this hectic rehab process. Yeah. And then when you get to the point where the physio says, hey, I'm, I'm happy if you want to go back to some, some drilling, you know, which I, I, I wish I could tell you when that was. I think that was at about three months. Physio is yeah. like, you can go back to some drilling and technique stuff, but, you know, there's no, like, no rolling, right? Yeah. Um, so even going back into that, I already knew, okay, I can't drill close guard, I can't drill butterfly guard, I can't, like my, my game is generally X guard and butterfly guard. Um, so I can't drill those, but I could drill on top passing, I could drill knee cutting to my good side, I could drill um, half guard and you know, this is kind of cool to reconnect with the half guard. So I think that all that's really valuable, being in the academy, it's good from a social aspect and it's good for also just um, starting to learn what capacities you do have. Um, if I think about, if I, I, I can't really identify when the point came where I felt confident to go back to sort of more intense rolling, because I guess that's sort of the next big sort of milestone where you, where you're like, okay, I'm, I'm happy to sort of go freestyle again. Yeah. I, I had two surgeries. The first one that I had, I sort of rehabbed really well. And, and I think probably at about six months six to nine months, I was sort of back training. Um, and then I went and had a checkup with the surgeon and they, I didn't have great range of motion in extension. I couldn't fully extend the knee. And the surgeon had suspected that 
that might be a limitation based on how he had re reconstructed the ACL. He said to me, um, I've made the ACL really thick, which is great because it's super strong. The only potential downside is that it's too thick and it impedes the ability of the knee to extend because the, the tissue that's inside the joint is, is just taking up too much space. So it kind of yeah. gets caught when you go into extension. Um, and so when I walked into his office that day, he saw that I was limping and he, he asked me why I was limping. And I responded, well, I trained jiu-jitsu last night and I, I'm limping after, after every night I train because my knee's a little bit sore, but it's no big deal. And he said, okay, so my suspicion was correct. We're going to need to do a second surgery. So that, that second surgery, you know, kind of unfortunately, whatever, right? It's what it is. You've been there yourself delayed the rehab process even further. And I can't remember if it was like nine months after that one before getting back into it. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I'll be honest, I um, getting back into more intense jujitsu training, it actually felt pretty good because the knee was quite strong. And I, I found that, that from, from after the surgery, once I'd gotten through that initial acute phase of getting the swelling down, rebuilding the muscle mass um and and regaining strength you know through through simple exercises squatting and deadlifting and that kind of stuff the i felt like my knee has became very strong very quickly however what what i lost which is the thing that i that i think is what is not spoken about as much and is perhaps what is equally detrimental to your jiu-jitsu performance as is strength uh, it was the coordination uh, and proprioception of that leg. So it's yeah. the things we take for granted where you just, you can pummel with your leg or you can knee cut or you can, um, uh, you know, you can use your, your foot, you know, you can place your foot where you want to, or you can hook, like you just have this dexterity to your legs that you, you know, that is your baseline. And yeah after you've had a surgery, you just drop way below that baseline. So you end up with this limb that is nowhere near as coordinated and, de as, and dexterous as it once was. And yeah. I think I realized that's where the potential for me for another injury is, is because I'm kind of, I'm grappling with this leg that doesn't really work very well. Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, a hundred percent because I'm, I'm at the stage now where, I'm, I'm walking and hubby and will often say to me, why are you limping? And I'm like, because it feels weird. It doesn't feel like I have, I'm, obviously my quad is still, um, there was a huge amount of atrophy in my quad uh, um, as most people probably experience. And I'm gaining that um, strength back, but yeah, it almost feels um, like I don't know how to walk <laughs> and I can definitely relate to that. And that's probably something I've read about a, a fair bit. Um, and obviously there's lots of exercises that you can do that can help that regain that connection. But, um, yeah. And I think that's not, I had experienced similar thing with my, um, core. We're having the surgery that I had last year, just little things. Like I seem to completely have lost that connection with my lower and upper body. It was insane. And, uh, my surgeon at the time did advise me to sort of take on a different sport to try or take on a different skill or do something else to try and um, get that connection between lower core and upper body going again. I don't think she thought kickboxing was the answer, but um, I think it definitely helped. And even when I started working the pads and trying to kick and work the pads, when I first started compared to where I was up until I you know, stopped training when I did my knee, the difference my coach was saying was insane. And it was just trying to get those nerve connections, everything just going again. Um, I've always been very, somewhat coordinated um always played sport my whole life and uh i did martial arts as a kid but not jiu-jitsu i did um, taekwondo so i've always been had that good connections and it was scary to think that i was so almost learning things learning to walk again learning to my mind said one thing and then my body said the other so um it's interesting to hear you talk about that because that's something that i've definitely i've already sort of looked into and there is a fear um of like you said the re-injury yeah yeah i think um and i think that with the uh like you go see a knee surgeon and their their perspective is knee centric so they they look at the knee and that 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 structure is 
well, the, the guy that I had, he's a really good knee surgeon. He's an orthopedic surgeon, so he understands bones and joints and connective tissue, but knees are his thing. So I don't know, this guy does fuck 250 ACL reconstructions a year or something ridiculous, right? Yeah. Um, his lens is, is looking through the knee. And so it's like, oh, well, this, this piece of, this cord is broken. So we're going to go in there and we're going to reattach that cord. And that cord is going to re uh, regain full strength at, you know, whatever, nine months, um, you know, so great. Like it's as simple, it's kind of black and white and it's very easy to get caught up in, in, uh, I mean, even myself with the, I have more of a considered opinion because I look at the body in a different way, but even with that, I'm like, Oh wow. Okay. Nine months. I'm going to be good. Like I'll be fucking back to what I was doing. And then you have the surgery and you get to that nine month point or whatever it is. And you're like, fuck, there's so much stuff that comes along with this that, that, yeah. that I kind of knew in the back of my head, but maybe didn't think about as much as I should have, which is like, yeah, they've cut through multiple layers of tissues, which while they've fixed that, that cord or that one piece of tissue, they've fucked up all these other ones that have now had to grow them back together. And there's all this scar tissue. They've cut yeah. through nerves. Um, even just the fact that they've drilled into your bones has caused this huge amount of trauma to, um, to the femur and to the lower parts of the leg. And so you have this whole recovery now from that trauma. So even though the, the ACL is fixed and in your case, the MCL, and I, I also had a bunch of meniscus repair at the same time, um, even though they've fixed all that and that's all looking pretty good. If you look just at that, they've caused all of this other collateral damage and it's generally just accepted in surgery that that's just what it is. If you're going to cut somebody open and start drilling shit, you're going to cause yeah. a bit of collateral damage. But the idea is that you're doing it. It's worthwhile, right? Because you're fixing the bigger issue. Um, yeah. So I think that, that, you know, for anyone who is, who is about to go for surgery or, you know, considering it, it's really important to consider all of that. And I, I wouldn't say in any way that that's, that that should stop you from doing it. But I think just in terms of managing your expectations, it's really important to be aware of that because you can get out and you can be at that point where the, where the surgeon's like, hey, Jess, your ACL is great, your MCL is great, off you go. But then you're walking out of the office, you're like, but my knee still feels fucked. Like, I'm still yeah. getting sore. I still feel uncoordinated. My range of motion isn't there. Like, and a lot of the stuff, for I think for most people, like you obviously have a very... Uh, like a good physical practice, right? Taekwondo, basket, like, you know, um, physically active uh, through your whole life, that builds a lot of body awareness, right? We probably take that for granted for a lot of folks who maybe don't have as much experience in the physical realm, who maybe take up jujitsu, find themselves staring down the barrel of a knee reconstruction or something like that. Um, when they come out of that surgery, it's very hard for, for a lot of folks to put their finger on what it is. Um, I think that lack of coordination and that lack of body awareness that happens after you've had surgery can be really awkward for some folks because you're like all the doctors and physios and stuff are telling you things are good, but you're like, I, but it doesn't, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel right. And so I guess it's, yeah, it's important to consider, uh, the totality of the effect after going through such a surgery, isn't it? Oh, a hundred percent. Um, I'm not sure what graft you had, but just the, the fact that I had a hamstring graft, I know there's going to be a lack of, or my surgeon said to me, you could lose up to 30% flexibility in that hamstring. And I thought, oh, and you don't, and I, I, I remember thinking at the time, oh man, that's going to, I'm quite flexible. That's not going to be good. Um, but at the time I'm like, no, I need the surgery. I need to get it done. So I'll just, oh, I'll work through that. But uh, I've had a uh, similar issues with the extension. So I've got my flexion up to, I think I'm up to 125, nearly 130 degrees now, but the extension because of the hamstring too, it tightens when I slip sleep, it tightens when I sit. So that's sort of stopped me and you need that leg to straighten to obviously walk properly. So um, yeah, so I think I definitely can relate to that in terms of, okay, yeah, this is, I need it done. Yeah, I'll just deal with that later. And even now I'm still going through like, oh my God, I didn't realize that my hamstring was going to be so tight. Um, and yeah, that's definitely going to affect when I do go back to training. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, and yeah, I guess for folks who aren't, aren't familiar with that, they tend to, for an ACL reconstruction, they'll either use the patella tendon, which is off the front of the knee, or they'll take it from the hamstring, which is on the back of the knee. And I think generally for, for jujitsu players, they prefer the hamstring because, um, if you do have the patella graft, then it, it's, it kind of hinders your ability to kneel down and put that part of your body on the floor. So yeah. it kind of makes more sense to take it from the back of the leg. But yeah, totally, right? They, they steal some tissue from the back of the leg. So that's going to cause issues there because you've now got less mass going on in that section. Um, how has your, you mentioned before that there's been a lot of atrophy, obviously, which is loss of muscle after the surgery, yeah. which is characteristic of any surgery. Um, how are you finding your uh, rebuilding of that muscle now that you're in that rehab process? Um, so initial, after I went through the initial shock of seeing what my quad looked like, um, once I take, I took the, um, the compression bandages off and comparing it with my other leg, it's quite shocking. Um, and just how fast it happens because I'm, I'm a regular uh, gym go. I do a lot of like strength, um, strength training. I love strength training. Uh, and I've always had a bigger lower set um, body. So I've always had quite strong legs. Uh, so to see how quickly that happened was devastating. And, and to know how much I took in the gym to build up that strength. Uh, but I'm, I'm getting there. And I know I, I was doing some stuff straight day one after surgery. I was doing the flexion activities to try and get that quad firing. And it, it, took, it took at least a couple of weeks for even it to start to fire. Um, I'm now doing, I can do um, some box squats, which I think very controlled only with the barbell. Um, but my physio is working with me to give me a, that little bit of a push to do something else. And then obviously in a controlled way, because she knows I'm probably knows me a little bit now that I, I want more, I need more, but yeah, we've got to do it nice and controlled. So I've found probably in the last week that I can actually see my quad, uh, firing or when I, when I squeeze it and hold it, I don't have as much, um, I have a bit more control on the, on the lag, the tests that they do do to hold that extension and to hold it once they um, release their support because yeah. initially I couldn't do that. And it was actually quite painful. I was getting that resonating pain down through the front of my kneecap, uh, which again was quite shocking because I thought, hang on, I didn't do anything to the front of my knee. But like you mentioned before, the trauma, once they go in there, they're drilling, there's all the swelling, um, the buildup of the scar tissue as well. So just squatting was, I was scared to sort of even, squat or go to the like go to the toilet like those basic things because i was sort of trying to do it on one leg um but yeah it's just slow i think with all the effort i'm i'm, I'm rehabbing net all the time um i'm even got the opportunity to do some at work which is really good so it's not that everything sort of stopped once i um went to work but sorry Sorry, my husband's just interrupting me. That's all right. Yeah, yeah. He'll, he'll hook the shit out of Yeah, up. and I'm worried. <laughs> he'll hook me. Yeah, that's one thing. I'm like, oh, my, I'm just venturing into the leg game, and I love the leg game. And now I'm like, oh, what am I going to do? Um, I'll just have to learn to defend it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I guess that I'm just at that stage now where I'm feeling a little bit stronger, but it's just like for the, the effort that I'm putting in and the results, they're not quite at the same sort of like my efforts up here but the results are sort of lagging but I'm very motivated though I'm very much after what I went through last year I was kind of like I wanted to just, I want to get back on the mats but I want to be fit and healthy for my family as well um and my job so <laughs> um yeah I don't like the motivation but don't get me wrong I still have my down days where I thought oh, come on like, what else can I do <laughs> yeah of course I mean look yeah I think um Someone said to me, you know, I've got, you know, you end up with so many friends who have had ACL reconstructions after you've done, you know, you realize, you know, they're so common, but um, one of my good friends who's a jujitsu purple belt, who would easily be a brown belt, maybe a black belt by now, if he hadn't have had it, he's had two ACL reconstructions, um, like both knees and, you know, just like shitty circumstances for him. But um, he said to me, uh, just after my surgery, he said, you won't know yourself at 12 weeks. He's like, it'll be totally different. And I thought, oh, that's cool. Um, and it kind of was the case. I look back, I'm like, holy shit. After that initial three months, I did notice that my rate of progress 
kind of increased exponentially in a way, yeah. um, which was cool. The, so I guess I'm passing that on to you that like, you're still really yeah. at the pointy end of the whole thing where, yeah, where you're doing all this work, you're rehabbing constantly all day and you're really not getting much payoff for it. But the thing is, I think where for people who, for gym goers like us, we're used to getting results in a different way. It's like you, you execute a movement like a deadlift or pull-ups or whatever you're working on and you can see the changes. You can see muscle growth, which is relatively fast. You can see strength gains, which is relatively fast. After surgery, you're obviously trying to, you're making strength gains, you're growing muscle, but you're, you know, you're promoting blood flow. You're getting connective tissue to, to lay down uh, new fibers. And connective tissue, I think, takes three times as long to turn over its cells than muscle does. So the process of rebuilding your connective tissue and fixing up all of that trauma is way slower than, than what we're used to in terms of normal gym activities. So, yeah, I think that you, you, it's, it, you, it's normal to feel like the stuff that I'm doing isn't doing anything, but that's just because you can't really see and you can't really feel the difference yet. Yeah. Um, I, I do like the, I know what we talked about before in terms of like the phases of the recovery and that they're pretty straightforward, right? You need to do this, this and this. And I do like that aspect of it because I like that like I've got these goals where I'm like, okay, I've set, got these goals before me and I do have my own goals they call them the hidden goals or secret goals I'm actually reading a book at the moment which has been I wonder if I had it close yeah it's been quite um helpful I don't know if you've seen rebound um oh, no. rebound oh, cool. yeah it's train your mind to bounce back stronger from sports injuries by um Carrie Jackson um yep. And they talk about how a lot of athletes or, or people, I, I know the term athlete, but I do train. So I sort of say, okay, all right, I'm going to have to refer to myself as an athlete. And they talk about how you have these standard goals and then you have these hidden ones where you kind of like secretly want to exceed them, right? And I'm, I even, when I go into my physio and she says, all right, we're aiming for 115 degrees. And I'm like secretly saying, no, we're going to get 120. Um, and and things, things like that. And how they can be good for your motivation, but they can be, detrimental as well um yeah high expectations and, yeah yeah and when you said before about having a lot of uh making a lot of friends that have had similar injuries and and i've done that i've uh but you also sort of go through that comparison phase where you think okay well they had an acl and they did this and they're riding their bike at you know i couldn't ride my bike until probably two weeks ago uh, and I thought, well, hang on, there's people that after three weeks, they're riding their bike. Like, what's wrong with me? Why am I doing it? And I'd really stop myself and go, well, hang on, everyone's different. One, you're not 20. <laughs> you know, I'm 37. So, um, and they might not have had an MCL tear. They might not have had this. So I really had to sort of catch myself and go, all right, you, you're on your own journey. Um, and as long as you're doing the best that you can do and you're doing all the right things, then you just have to wait. and. <laughs> And like you said, hopefully there comes a time where things start going a little bit faster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like that time is, is, is always going to come, right? Um, that's a really good point you make. Like comparison can be a real motherfucker in this situation. I, you know, I've got, I run a gym and I've got people in my gym who have, you know, coming in post knee surgeries and I'm helping them at different stages of their rehab and stuff. But I remember one of the guys who's a skateboarder, a really, really high level skateboarder who uh, had his reconstruction done the same time as mine. And when he came into the gym, he must have come in at around six months post-surgery. And I was, I was really, you know, I still, like I, my range of motion is not particularly good. I have to work really hard at it. And I asked him about his expecting him to be in a similar situation because everything we'd spoken about kind of mirroring one another. And the guy showed me his squat and his extension and it was fucking impeccable. And I was in my mind, I'm oh man, why don't I have that? Like I'm the, you know, like, fuck, like I've been working so hard at this and look at this guy's squat. And he's like, oh no, I've never had any, I've, I could, I've had good range of motion, you know, since like, since I had the surgery, it's not been a problem. For me. Um, cut to like, whatever the flip side of that, this guy has had these other recurring issues as a result of his surgery 
uh, at different intervals over the last 12 months. And you'll come, man, I don't know what's happened, but my knee gave out or, you know, I got this shooting pain and I've had to go back to the physio. So what I've, what I've come to understand is that the journey is just so different for so many people. And, um, you know, you might have one aspect of your recovery that feels really slow, but then you might have also one aspect of it that compared to somebody else has been incredibly fast. Um, so yeah, it's important to, to always like sort of keep that at the front of your mind, uh, that no one, no two journeys are going to be the same. And so, yeah, if you find yourself comparing it, it can, it, whatever, it can make you feel good sometimes, right? Like I, when, when he was telling me, when I look back and I'm, and his name's Joe as well, but I'm like, fuck, Joe's had recurring issues with his knee. It makes me feel better because I haven't, uh, which is a little yeah. bit mean, right? But yeah, it's just human yeah. nature. Um, yeah. But at the same time, I got, you know, depressed when he had great range of motion. So yeah, you yeah. got to just like see it, like you said, you got to just go, all right, that's, that's what they're going through. This is what I'm going through. And I know that I'm following the process and that I'm making the best of the situation. Yeah, exactly. And like you said, it's, it's human nature. And it, I just had to catch and rephrase is that when I do, yeah, find myself going, all right, well, they're doing that and you know, they're back on the mats already. Or, and I said, we'll catch us like, well, hang on, I'm going to be stronger. Like, I'm going to make sure myself, I'm going to be as strong as, you know, as I can be when I get back and to set myself up for success or, you know, all the chance or, you know, minimising the chance of bring injury, but um, yeah, catching and rephrasing. <laughs> I've done a lot of it lately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, something, a, a note I made before that, that I think is important to, to mention, and, and it sounds like this would be stuff that you would already be aware of or that when the time is right, your physio will make you aware of it because it sounds like you're following all of the right processes there. Um, but something that, you know, I see, um, I see a lot of people, um, post-surgery who uh who really highlight their the strength progress that they make and they and the strength is measured you know with typical things like back squatting or deadlifting or like box jumps um typical you know great gym movements that that people use uh which i use myself right and it's really important that the strength is developed and that you get that stuff back right like uh, and it, and I think it's a very it's also a very good milestone if you could say you could deadlift double body weight before your surgery and then at some point post surgery you get back to deadlifting double body weight that's an excellent like thing to check off your list and go all right I've got that capacity back but what I came to understand for myself was that the strength comes back pretty quickly um, especially for someone who comes from an active lifestyle with a with a long training history before you know it, you'll be back squatting and deadlifting and that stuff will be pretty good. But what I found hasn't come back quickly. And this is the stuff that is typically, we're not as good at at measuring it. And that's the proprioception and the agility. And I'm talking about like your ability to balance on one leg, your ability to balance while, you know, while under load, um, your ability to hop or jump. So to be agile on the feet and change directions. And these are all things, capacities that we need for jujitsu, right? Um, We would like to have, you can develop a game if you don't have them. But uh, I find that those are the things that have been the slowest to develop. And I think that uh, it's very easy to get caught up in, oh, I'm hitting all my strength markers and the range of motion is pretty good. So I'm there, like I'm I'm back to where I was which is totally not the case because I think that the, the proprioception and the agility that really speaks to this coordination piece that we were talking about earlier, where it's like, yes. yeah, maybe you got like strong quads and strong hammies again, but you've got this uncoordinated leg now because you've gone through this trauma. So I find that those aspects of my training, uh, even though they're potentially not as satisfying to work on, on a daily or weekly basis, they are the things that, uh, that are actually pushing the needle for me when it comes back to, you know, trying to return to a knee that feels like it's part of my body again. Yeah. Oh, and I can see, like, even right there when you said that about the one-legged stuff, I get, like, my knee almost twinges because the thought of, 
of doing that kind of stuff like it's, it's scary right even balance even taking like um putting my work pants on and stuff like that bouncing on that one leg i'm like oh and i've and i've watched a lot of videos and looked at a lot of things because that's um something that i've read about that just gets pushed aside because it's easier to track your strength gains um and like i said they when you can see the weights going up as opposed to oh like how do I really track if I can balance well and, and whatnot. So, um, but yeah, that's really, that's really interesting that you say that. I think that's something that I'm going to have to um, definitely work on. Yeah. Yeah. I think, and I mean, I think back, even running was a bit of one of those things for me because I got back to running after the first surgery pretty early. I don't know what it was, maybe five months or something. Um, you know, running in very specific, like short bursts following drills that my physio gave me. But it was also like, oh, I'm back to running. Like I'm running, I'm squatting, I'm deadlifting, I'm good. But then I did, after my second surgery, I did all these other tests with, um, with a different, or actually with an exercise physiologist. And he just uncovered so much stuff that I was bad at. And it was like, man, like, look at all this. That's terrible. And I was like, wow, it was very easy for me to be oblivious to that if I, if I never went through these tests. Um, yeah. But, you know, once you know about it, then you can start to work on it, right? You can do something, yeah. Do something about it, yep. Well, look, um, I think, yeah, if there's something else that's on your mind, share it there, but otherwise, we're, we're probably a good place to wrap it up. Yeah, that was, that was excellent. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. It's, um, yeah, it's cool to, you know, it's cool to be able to hopefully pass something on and at least anyone who watches this, you know, will probably hopefully take something away from it. Um, yep. there's a, there's a lot of things discussed there. Yeah. I, I wish you all the best over the rest of the, the rehab process, which, you know, however many yep. years that takes. Um, yeah. but I, you know, I hope you can get back on the mat soon enough. And, you know, I think the, the, the big thing is it will improve. And what you're doing is the right thing. Just keep doing it, you know? Yeah, thank you, Joe. That was awesome. I really appreciate it. And I'll, um, I'll, I'll let you know when I'm back on the mats. <laughs> yeah, dude, that'd be really cool. And I mean, uh, obviously, um, I know, I mean, I don't know him personally. Well, we've never met face-to-face, but I know Ross, your coach. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah. JT and I have been, you know, once the situation is right, we want to do a bit of a tour visit some of the academies who are with the Bulletproof program and, and just and just catch up with our friends and get to yeah. come in other parts of the country. So hopefully we can come up there and meet you all face-to-face soon enough. Oh, definitely. Ross um, loves you guys. And um, you should. I think he's, as he's shown you all the kettlebell stuff that he has, he's got all the kettlebells <laughs> yeah. in the gym. Yeah, loves it. Um, and like the girls, because we have our um, girl base in our gym, all the, the women, women um, we've got our women's only um, classes but the female component in our gym and the membership growth has been insane. And that's largely due to, to Ross. Um, so we all, a few of us girls get together and we do your program and we do like the, more so the mobility and not so much now, but obviously before my injury. Um, and yeah, Ross is just incredible. And I think I owe him a lot for where I am in my jiu-jitsu journey and where a lot of like women who have now started up sport, like it's just incredible. So we'd love to have you guys up there. I know he would. Yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be cool. Hopefully, um, hopefully real soon. And uh, hopefully yep. by that time, you can be back on the mat in some capacity. Yep, for sure. Awesome. All Cheers, right. mate. Thank you. Pleasure, Jess. All the best. See ya.